Well, there are many applications to social network analysis, and now that we have Facebook, other social media tools that are available to us, we can look at many different applications of social network analysis. What does the World Wide Web look like? How do people access information on it? What do scientific communities look like? Who collaborates with whom? Who cites whose work? And how do those influences spread? Sexual interaction and contact, the spread of STDs and HIV. How people communicate with one another using phones, cell phones, mobile phones, other communication technologies. In public health, we use social networks to understand community health promotion activities. How are organizations interacting with one another? What do interorganizational collaborations mean? And how do we evaluate community-based participation? participatory research using network analytic tools. We can do textual analysis, looking at when words co-occur in text. We can look at neural networks, disease transmission, behavior change. Virtually any phenomenon or behavior that you can think of can be seen through a network lens, and there are important network explanations for those behaviors. So I've been talking about social network analysis. What is it? Well, it is a set of theories, methods, techniques, and approaches that explain how things are connected and how the structure of those connections influence outcomes. Principally, network analysts are interested in relationships. Relationships matter. Um, Advice-seeking relationships, friendships, communications, who you go to lunch with, who's a good leader, all of those relationships are important for explaining how organizations, communities, organisms, any kind of, of collective functions. Typically, network analysis uses census sampling techniques and saturation sampling techniques such that everybody in the community is interviewed or is part of the network design. We graph those social networks and we use mathematics to describe the networks in formal mathematical ways. There are many different disciplines that contribute to the science of social network analysis. Just about every discipline one can imagine uh, has reason to understand social networks and make a contribution to its scientific growth and development. Principally, in public health, we're interested in how social networks influence behavior and what are the kind of individual level effects that we can measure through social network analysis. We know that awareness and knowledge of new ideas and practices spread through social contact networks. We know that detailed knowledge about how you use something, where you can go to replace it, or what you might do um, to, to fix it when it's broken passes through your social networks. And the perceptions of what is normative, peer pressure, what is appropriate to do, all flow through these interpersonal contact networks. And we understand them by typically measuring social network exposure. That is, we have an individual, and when we look at the behavior rates of the people in that person's personal network, we can measure the degree to which a person is exposed to a new behavior. And we believe that, generally speaking, as your exposure level increases to a behavior, your you're more likely to engage in that behavior. So for example, a person who has uh, friends who smoke, as more and more of those friends smoke, the likelihood that a person smokes will increase. We also know, however, that there are varying thresholds to adoption, that it's not always simply just an increase. The more persons that are doing something, the more likely you are to do it. Some people have very low thresholds to adoption, and they're willing to engage in a new behavior before anybody else is. A new uh, iPhone app becomes available. This person may be willing to use that app when only a minority of people in their friendship network are already doing it. They have low thresholds to behavior. We can calculate network exposure by using mathematical tools. This is just simply a diagram to illustrate how that gets done. We have a network which is typically stored as a matrix of who's connected to whom. We can multiply that matrix by a vector of scores, let's say attitude towards new technology. We can divide it by the number of connections a person has, and we get a new score which is a network exposure weight. Very simple mathematical manipulation to calculate network exposure which we can do for diseases, behaviors, attitudes, virtually any attribute that we're interested in. Well, there are some classic diffusion network data sets. These data sets, I mentioned the medical innovation data earlier, these data sets have data on when individuals adopted a new idea of practice and the social connections, either advice seeking, discussion, or friendship among members of the community. 
There are six diffusion network studies that have been conducted historically, and only three of those studies do we still have the data. For the other three studies, the data are lost. These data are publicly available, and they're available from me and on a public uh, website that I maintain called the Empirical Networks Project. And you'll see these three data sets come from three different continents. There are three different behaviors, and they were collected at three different times. The most famous of these data sets is the medical innovation study of 125 physicians across four communities and their adoption of tetracycline. Second study was a study of Brazilian farmers' adoption of hybrid seed corn. That occurred over a 20-year period. The data were collected in 1966, and you can see there's variability in the percent of penetration of hybrid seed corn across the different 11 different communities. And the Korean family planning study, the data were collected in 1973. There were 25 different villages. All of the women in each village were interviewed about their friendships, their advice-seeking and discussion partners, and and asked when they first started to use contraception. Data sets have been used repeatedly by a variety of scholars to try to understand how social network influences behavior and the diffusion of practices. Well, if networks are so important, then how can we use social networks to try to accelerate the behavior change process? Indeed, much of the interventions that we do ignores the social network structure that exists in a community, an organization, or a school. And in fact, we probably want to understand those set social networks and use it to accelerate behavior change. Many scholars have taken this information and used it to identify important individuals who are influential in a community and use them as behavior change agents. So for example, in this school network that I showed you before, here we have um, a network and we can identify who the important individuals are in that network. Now if we consider one person in the network, number 22 for example, we understand that not only is 22 a member of a particular network, but if we're going to try to change 22's behavior, finding influential people that are in a different part of the network than 22 is, those individuals, number two, is not going to be influential on 22's behavior. Nor is person number three. They're important for other parts of the network, but not for person 22. If you want to change person 22's behavior, you want to find an influential person who is proximate to number 22, namely person number 18. So it's not only important to identify those key opinion leaders in a network, but also to appreciate that different opinion leaders act as opinion leaders for different people in a network based on the network structure. Uh, many years ago in a paper we published in 1999, Valenti and Davis, we specified what this model would look like and the role of opinion leaders in the behavior change process. And rather than just identifying who the influential nodes are, we came up with a system where you identify those influential nodes and match them to their followers. Indeed, there are many different kinds of ways one can use network data to structure behavior change interventions and accelerate the diffusion process. You can identify key opinion leaders and there have been over 20 studies conducted to identify these key opinion leaders and allow them to act as change agents. You can also use network data to identify naturally occurring subgroups in a network and create interventions that are specifically designed for those subgroups. You can also, as I just mentioned, identify leaders and match individuals to the leaders that they identified or identify the subgroups and, and identify leaders within each of those subgroups. You can also use snowball techniques, the so-called respondent-driven sampling approach, where you can snowball out from a clinic or an intervention site and and recruit people into a study by using their naturally occurring networks. Or you can rewire networks. You can identify links and nodes in, in a network that need to be changed in order to make a network more cohesive or less cohesive, more, more or less centralized, and so on and so forth. And of course, Although these first five intervention techniques are somewhat well specified and we have some experience with all of them, there are other options 
including identifying low threshold adopters, paying attention to the critical mass, and using feedback mechanisms that may also be helpful and influential for accelerating behavior change. That is just a brief introduction to the diffusion world, its history, some of its principles. These are a couple of books that I've written on this topic, which you're welcome to, to peruse to get more information or send me an email if you have questions. I'll be glad to try to answer them. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. I hope you found this useful.